Hello and welcome back to the National Running Pod Show, episode two. My name's Dom and I'll be narrating your way through this show. Coming up on this week's episode. Radio presenter Vassos Alexander tells us about his start in the running world and offers advice to other new starters. Kate from Harrier Trail Running is here to give us the lowdown on running vests. In the tech segment, Josh Patterson is here to tell us all about the runner app. Last week's main guest, Steve Cram, is here to tell us all about the Wild Goat Festival. In nutrition, Revive Active are here to tell us all about the magic world of supplements. And finally, in the advice section, Jules from Running Rewire tells us why having a running coach might not actually be that daunting. Don't forget our sponsors, Runderwear, are giving away £100 worth of vouchers every single episode. Enter for your chance to win through the link in the episode description. So let's head over to our host, ultra runner Elise Downing, founder of Runderwear, Jamie Smalley, and founder of the National Running Show, Mike Seaman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of the National Running Show pod show in association with Runderwear. Thank you for making it to episode two. We never thought we'd make it this far, but we have, so welcome back. So I'm here with Jamie Smalley from Runderwear. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm all good, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm good. good I'm good, good. good. I'm excited. And Elise Downing. Hi, how are you? We are good. <laughs> Elise, this is your episode to be introduced to our audience. So you have done a thing, haven't you, which you talk about a little bit. So what are you famous for, Elise? A little bit. Even my own mum called me a one-hit wonder recently. <laughs> um, so eight years ago now, um, I ran a lap of Great Britain. So basically ran the coast of England, Wales and Scotland. I was young and stupid and had no idea what I was doing. Well, and you, re- you really did have no idea, didn't you? you were, what was your sort of preparation for this? Almost non-existent. And I think sometimes when people ask, they think I'm just being a bit like, modest when I said I didn't know what I was doing and I'm like I honestly did no planning like I get emails from people saying they want to do similar challenges and ask for advice on planning and they're like I'm not trying to be unhelpful but I cannot give you any what was your base fitness when you sort of took off like what was the so basically I I was not a sporty kid at all I hadn't done any sport or running or anything and then at university I started running a little bit just because I wanted to get a bit fitter and I couldn't afford to go to the gym so I'd done a half marathon and I'd done a marathon that I had not trained for, didn't know, I just didn't understand about running. I didn't understand nutrition or anything. I was dressed as a purple Crayola crayon and <laughs> a small child because I cried for eight miles. It was the worst, like, five and a half hours of my life. And a small child heckled me and called me the crying crayon. <laughs> and that was about a year and a half before I set off to do the coast. And yeah. I, but I think ignorance was bliss. I just didn't not... I think if I'd done more, like I've done quite a lot of like ultras and multi-day sort of runs and stuff now. And I think if I'd done more stuff like that, I would have thought, well, it's so hard running like for three days. How could you possibly do that for 10 months? You must have had so many dark moments in that. Yeah. Because how long was the whole duration? 10 months in the end. So 10 months. 10 months. I cried a lot. (laughs) And how much were you running every single day? What sort of distance? So it was 5,000 miles in total. And so that averages out about 17 miles a day. But I was doing a lot less at the beginning and a lot because I was very unfit. Yeah. And then a lot more at the end. So I kind of, at the beginning often I was doing like 5, 8, 10 miles. And then I just had felt like such a fraud because I was like people do more than this running to work and I'm <laughs> abandoned my life to go on this big challenge but then by the end like it's amazing how your body just does a can adapt and I was yeah. doing like 20 30 miles and that just felt normal at the time and I imagine now that changed your body from from then on did you feel like after you've done something like that I, I, I felt it when I've done certain, yeah. you know, big things. I feel like, oh, it's complete body change. Did you feel that? Did you, like, when you started then going into ultras after you'd done the run, it was just a bit easier kind of thing? Or yeah, th- I think you just do, just build at that base level of, like, moving a lot. Because yeah. I think, and also it just changed my whole lifestyle. Like, now... I just walk everywhere. I get in a lot of steps every day without, and I don't feel like I don't feel human if I yeah. don't do that anymore. Whereas, I, and I do look at pictures, and it's not even that, like I still have a lot of the same clothes. It's not necessarily that I was a different size. I just am a different, completely different like, body shape, yeah. and yeah. it's um, yeah, it's amazing how yeah. you're. But I guess like as humans, we are made to spend a lot less time sitting down than yeah. we do, and yeah. so I think it just kick started a lot less sedentary yeah. lifestyle. Really, what was the weirdest thing that happened to you when you were doing a lap? Of the UK. So I should say, so I set off with like my tent 
and all my kit in my backpack. I didn't have a support crew or anything. Um, and I thought I'd be camping every night. <laughs> the night knows the answer to this. So I thought I'd be camping every night, but I actually ended up staying with like more than 200 complete strangers. Um, which like people who'd like read my blog, people from local running clubs, and it was amazing. Like, and ma- the main thing I learned was how nice people were. Yeah. But obviously there were a few weirdos. <laughs> and one guy, he was basically I did tend to vet people a bit who offered me a place to stay, and I only really stayed with like families. You better hear that. Did nice. stay clear of the lone men, I've got <laughs> to say. <laughs> but I stayed with this guy who was kind of connected to someone I knew, so I thought it was a safe bet, and. It was a really muddy, like wet, windy day when I got there. So I was going to put my stuff in the washing machine and I was going to put my shoes in because they were disgusting. I only had like one set of everything with me, really. And then he said, oh, we'll go out for dinner at my local. So um, I was like, oh, okay, I won't put my shoes in the washing machine then. And he said, no, 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 it's fine. You can borrow some of mine. I was like, no, I, I don't really want to. But anyway, I ended up going out for dinner in his size 10 men's leather brogues with my running <laughs> kit. And the whole evening was just really awkward. So that was one of my weirder instances. <laughs> You've had so many. And are, are there any, obviously, going around the coast of the UK, like, there must be some quite hairy moments. And, you know, we've got some yeah. vicious wildlife, right, that you were pretty scared of. Yeah, I'm terrified of cows. <laughs> I didn't realise this, but it turns out I'm scared of basically all farmyard animals. <laughs> So that was a bit of a hindrance. But then I come to events like this and hear people talk about these big adventures they've been on and they'll have, like, ran across Africa and encountered, like, all this wildlife. And I was like, I was scared of sheep. But you, did you not take a massive detour once to avoid a load of cows? Every day. <laughs> like, honestly, like, the amount of extra miles I added on and the amount of trespassing I did, the poor farmers... <laughs> It's insane. I mean, what an utterly incredible achievement. We it could is. do, like, a full yeah. episode on that. Yeah. But going going from beyond that, you've obviously done quite a few ultra races since and other things, so do you want to talk us through any of those, any that, that jump out to you? Yeah, so I think I've got really into kind of the mountain running side of things now. I just love being in the mountains, and it turns out if you run, you can do get to see a bit more than if you walk. Not much in my case, because I'm actually terrible at running up and down hills but I did um, the Lavarado Ultra in the Dolomites in June which was 80k and it was just the most stunning race in the world so and I just think if you're going to suffer you might as well do it somewhere beautiful yeah, it's a good, and it a doesn't good hurt as much I like that and European yeah. mountain races always have a really good aid station it's like cheese it's like a charcuterie board out there it's all, it's all about the cheese yeah. like, <laughs> cheese in an ultra it's like game changer cheese and salami yeah. like, I really struggle with eating and I'm like really not good at gels but yeah, like cheese, salami, olives. I can do That's a whole race on the Salty potatoes. Mm. Yeah, salty potatoes. Yeah. potatoes. Coming up soon. <laughs> um, OK, well, look, it's great to get a bit of time with Elise. And at, at the start of every one of our episodes, we want to talk about one of the topics that we've got coming on. So the topic I'd like us to talk to you about today is advice. So if you had one piece of advice to give any of our listeners today, what would it be? I'm going to come to you first, Elise. Um, I think it's just to, like, there's obviously so much inspiration flying around. You come to something like the National Running Show or listen to the podcast and... There's so many different voices, and I think it's just to pick the thing that resonates with you. Like, you might want to go really far, go really fast, bumble around, have a cup of tea. And I think it's to just find the advice that resonates with you, which might not be this, but, and tune out the rest, because otherwise works. there's a lot of and noise. Works, yeah. Really, right. Because some advice can work for someone. Yeah. And- can't for another. Oh, I think that's. I think that's a really good point because it's mm. really easy mm. to get loads of like in input. Yeah. And actually, that can sometimes set you off mm. on the wrong course because you can think like, yeah. oh, I, I need to be mm. like them. Yeah. And with the greatest one yeah. in the world, you're never mm. going to be like me because you're kind of half the size. And I found that. <laughs> I found out when I was doing the run around the coast that people kept, kept giving me advice and they might, they, a lot of them were like amazing runners, much better than me, but they hadn't actually done what I was doing. They hadn't, and so I think it's really easy to, yeah, get a bit overwhelmed by advice. Yeah, amazing. And what about you, Joe? Um, I would say nutrition, getting that right. I think as a start, as a newbie runner, I didn't get that right in the early, t- in the early days. And then once I got that right, that was a game changer in my marathon running and, yeah. and actually getting the time. So I think nutrition's big. And then coming back to the point that you've kind of made is that I can recommend a bar or a gel or something and it works for me. Yeah. It won't work for you. Yeah, yeah. And so mm-hmm. I think it is, a, it is a case of trial and error. So my thing would be get your nutrition, trial it, that's the that's the game changer for me. And I think we'll have a proper talk on nutrition in one of the future episodes as yeah. well. So no, I think that's that's good advice, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Just like to highlight the competition that we've got running with 
Rundaware, and if you'd like to enter to win a £100 voucher, then check the show notes and there's loads of details on how to do that, or head back to the previous competition in episode one. Um, also, if you want to get a 10% off, then go to Rundaware website and at the checkout enter Pod Show. that's P-O-D-S-H-O-W, and you will get a 10% off anything that you get there. Now, straight into the next bit of content, thank you very much for this. Did anyone else have staying at Strange Men's House and escaping cows on their bingo? Me neither. Anyway, straight into the first part of the interview with Vassos Alexander. Hey, it's Elise here, and I'm chatting today to Vassos Alexander. I feel quite excited to be chatting to you today because we've done this in reverse a couple of times. So, um, yeah, it feels a bit scary to be interviewing such a pro <laughs> interviewer. <laughs> but... um... It's a delight to talk to you. It's always a delight, whoever's asking the questions. But for anyone who's not so familiar with you, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Um, I am a sports presenter. Um, I work with Chris Evans on the radio show, on the breakfast show on Virgin Radio currently. Um, and I run a lot, probably more than is good for my knees. <laughs> I think most of us could say that. <laughs> so what came first, the running or the radio? Oh, the radio came first. OK. In fact, I was... Um, I was, I remember, there was one day I was going to, I was presenting a show on Five Live um, late in the evening and I was coming back from golf and I noticed, I just sort of had a look down my belt and there was a little, <laughs> there was a little, there was a, just the start of a little spare tyre. Yeah. And, and I thought, okay, so I've hit my 30s and I can't just eat what I want and do no exercise. And, um, and I thought, well, I'll do some exercise. And I, and I tried, and I tried going to personal trainer and then I tried running and then I thought oh running and so I'm you know I write books about running and I'm constantly at you know places yeah. like this like the national running show talking about running because I'm I'm like a born again Christian <laughs> you know I've suddenly I've seen the light yeah. and so I'm a sort of I'm a born again I'm an evangelical runner because I came to it late in life I've sort of realized how much better a life with running in it is than a life without. So you weren't kind of running as a child because sometimes you, I chat to people and they're like, started running from when I was born. So that and you were doing it all through school. So no, that wasn't your story no, not at, at all. all. No, I just I didn't I didn't really I was a bit golf, a bit of exercise, yeah. a bit of swimming when I was in you know growing up in Greece. But no running really. I mean, the, looking back on the sort of the school cross country, I didn't hate it as much as I pretended to, and everyone else I thought was pretending to, but. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I didn't look back on them with particular love, but then when I started running now, you know, it ticks like lots of different boxes for lots of different people. It ticks all of those boxes yeah. for me. You know, um, it ticks the fitness box and the mental health box and the just space and all, everything. It's just it's good for me on every level. It's not easy. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't often go out and think what I want to do right now <laughs> is get out in the minus two temperatures and run in the snow like we've had this week. But to be honest. You never regret a run, and every single time, I just I feel grateful that I've discovered it relatively, relatively early in life. I mean, I was in my early 30s, and I just think, oh, this is great. And so I just I ran, and then I ran a half marathon just because um, that was what we were doing. We were doing a slightly... <laughs> we, were, we were on a push to get more listeners in the north of England, and so we did a couple of weekends in Newcastle, and I think Hull. And the Newcastle one coincided with the Great North Run, yeah. so there was a sort of five live presence at the Great North Run. Ran the Great North Run, had a chaperone, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, a guy called Paul, and we chatted all the way, and I loved it. And I thought, well, well, if I can do a half marathon, maybe yeah. I can do a marathon. And then you just see what you know, see where it takes you, see where the, the journey takes you. I never planned when I started yeah. running to think. I'm going to run all these ultras and, you know, 100 miles is going to be my best dis I sort of wish it wasn't. Yeah. You know, it does take a long time to train for and run 100 miles, but I just love it. I love hearing that because I think sometimes... I've actually got a friend and we sometimes sort of talk about all the people who seem to be in the running world who don't seem to like running that much. And I think when people talk about motivation stuff, like you say, it's not always that you don't wake up and think, great, I'll go out of this freezing cold rain this mm. morning but I think the most the biggest motivator just is enjoying it and like finding mm. the element of running you actually like yeah. doing so <laughs> this this um this week Wednesday night Thursday night Thursday night I was due a bit of exercise I'd cycled to work and back I got in um I got in the serpentine which is the lake in the middle of Hyde Park on my way to work which was silly early mm. in the morning so I I could have gone to bed without doing yeah a run but I sort of knew I was owed it and, and I wanted it and my dog needed to go out. And I thought, well, I'm not just going to run out my front door because it's a beautiful, 
clear, crisp evening. I'm going to drive so that I don't have to run the two miles mm -hmm. to Richmond Park. So I've only got half an hour or so yeah. in me. And I ran to the gates of Richmond Park. It was dark. And I had half an hour, 40 minutes in the park on my own with my dog, with the stars <laughs> and the moon and the cold eating into my fingers. But And so I was, I was running a little bit quicker than I probably could have done mm. or should have done. So I was uncomfortable, but I was so happy. I was yeah. so in the moment. And I just, and again, I was just like, gosh, every time running just, running gives back. Yeah. You, all you have to do is get out the front door and running does the rest for you. Yeah, definitely. I definitely find sometimes I struggle with when I'm like trying to write or talk about a run because I really struggle to get the like jeopardy out of it sometimes because I'm like, I went to do a thing I like doing. It was hard, but I knew it was going to be hard but I liked doing it. And mm. sometimes it's hard to, to yeah, like come yeah. up with all the dramatic story around it. People say to me, are you, are you being sponsored? This time last year was yeah. the Arc of Attrition, which is this 100 mile um, race around the southwest coast path in Cornwall. You've run it, of course you have. I, ha I haven't run it. You I haven't run the Arc, but you've run that oh, bit yeah. of coastline. Um, and, and it's in the depths, it's next weekend, isn't it? This yes, year? It's the yeah. depths it was of just, January yeah. for anyone who's not aware. Yeah, and it's, a long, it's a long night, yeah. you know, and it's a lot of up and downs, and it's, 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 t it's yeah. a tough one. It's maybe the toughest 100 miler we've got in the UK. Um, and so people are saying, are you going to get sponsored? Yeah. And I went, well, no, because people know that I do yeah. this for fun. <laughs> yeah, I, it's going to be tough, and it was tough, yeah. you know. I got thoroughly, you know, Cornwall won, me nil. I, I did finish. Um, maybe one all then. But um, but yeah, it's like it's one of those. You you, you do this for fun, yeah. so yeah, I, 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 I struggle as well to, to sort of persuade people that um, yeah, I'm doing it and it's it's outside my comfort zone. But then but that, then they realise that that's what you that's your game. I, I that's my that's absolutely my bag. Yeah. Getting outside my comfort zone. Even so, this week has been freezing. Um, I have an ice bath in my garden, mm -hmm. and. Um, we also have a sort of a hammock, but there's no hammock in winter, so we, we bring the hammock bit inside and we've got the frame. Yeah. And I hung my shorts outside on the hammock and they froze. Yeah. So that literally there was no, like, giving them, you could flick them and they were making sound and then you drop them and they basically bounce. Yeah. Um, I thought that'd be cool. What if I wear those for my... There was their boxes, they're yeah. running shorts, actually, but I, I, I'm always, you know, I always wear wrenches, so I'm always ready to go for a run. Um... <laughs> And uh, and then and it's the same. It's like, what would happen? You know, what would happen if I ran a hundred miles around Cornwall yeah. in January at night when I'm not quite ready for it, not quite trained for it? What would happen if I put on literally <laughs> freezing running shorts as underwear today? That's sort of in my yeah. brain, and I and I quite like that. I quite like that about myself. Although I did admit this on the radio this this week, and pretty much nobody agreed. No, I think there definitely is. Some, I think that is a part that's in some people's brains. And I think you've kind of either got it or mm. you've not. How did you go from... Because you've run a pretty decent marathon time. I think I remember you doing a talk about it at the running show. How did you go from that kind of running to realising 100 miles is your best distance? What was the um, progression like there? I worked really hard to get a sub three yeah. marathon. And I did. 2.59, yeah. taking it. <laughs> um, in London, when was that? 2016... Um, but I had started running in the South Downs. I remember I was uh, hosting the Keswick Mountain Festival oh, yeah. one year and I did a trail half marathon, which absolutely beat me up. Yeah. I just, I mean, there is no better feeling than, you know, cresting a fell on a yeah. beautiful May morning. You know, the whole of the Lake District in England spread yeah. before you. Um, and... And I sort of fell in love with trail running. And then um, I sort of got more into it and then thought, what if I ran a bit further than a marathon? And I did, as a lot of people, as, as their sort of entry to ultra running was one of the uh, Race to the Stones, I think yeah. I did. And then and then the 100 milers. And then I just, if you look, so I've run beyond 100 miles, like the Spartatlon is 155. Yeah. But the last 30, I was in all yeah. sorts of trouble. Um but I tend to finish a hundred miler in pretty good order and in a pretty good time. So I'm not, I'm not elite level by any stretch. Yeah. But if you look at my times, like my five k times, ordinary. Yeah. My marathon time is okay, but my hundred mile time is sort of pretty yeah. good. So yeah, <laughs> my son is the same, and yeah. we we go for runs. And sometimes we're at, he was at Wimbledon Park training with uh, with an athletics club, and we're looking at the sprinters, and they do 
20 seconds work, 10 minutes rest. Yeah. 20 seconds work, 10 minutes rest. And we're thinking, we're the opposite. Yeah. We do 10 minute <laughs> repeats around yeah. the track, 20 seconds rest. Yeah, I was um, And they look so good as well <laughs> when they're running. They don't look shuffling along, yeah. you know, vomit down their front. They look beautiful, they're like the perfect humans yeah. sprinting around the track and then sitting down. And we thought, oh, you know, if I had my time again, I would have been a little bit quicker twitch, muscles, <laughs> yeah. if I could choose. But, you know, I've got what I've got. And I also, I'm quite grateful to it because I get to be on the Southwest Coast path at 3am on my own, literally just me against the distance and me not against the, uh, not against the, the, the path, but me sort of following that, but you know, you can talk about this better than I can, but just following that path around and there's yeah. nothing else in the world that exists apart from you and your feet and that little bit of light that you can see in your head torch. Yeah, definitely. I think it's like the way you're willing to suffer because for me, like a 5K is the worst or like a, a hard half marathon because it's that like short suffering, mm. whereas I'd much rather do a sort of low level suffer for yeah. about 12 hours. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Part two with Vassos will be back later, and trust me, there's some fantastic advice in there. But for now, let's talk about Kit with Harrier Trail Running. Hi, it's Jamie here from Runderwear, and I'm here with Kate today from Harrier, and we're going to be talking race packs and running packs. So, yeah. lovely to have you in. Thank you so um, much. Can you tell us a little bit of background as to the how the brand came about? Yes, yeah, so we are Harrier Trail Running, and... Uh, the company started by myself about three years ago yeah. and we just wanted to make really great quality kit for trail runners specifically for trail running um, and specialize in things like race vests very good very good what got you into trail running just as a bit of background well i used to live in nottingham and um i used to get fed up with getting beeped at by people <laughs> shouting out yeah. of windows when i was running on the roads so yeah. i just started running on the trails i used to do a lot of rambling with my mum when i yeah. was a kid so i went back to like the peak district areas yeah. and got back into doing the ro the routes running rather than hiking and just picked it up i didn't know it was trail running at the time but Fantastic. then i realized afterwards and what was the what was the moment where you thought okay i want to make a race pack um, I think I just always wanted to work for myself. So I had mm. a nine to five corporate job for a lot of years. Yeah. And then I did a lot more investigating and looking at product design and thought I could do this. Um, and the race vests was the first product that we did yeah. that was designed by ourselves. Okay, so a lot of people run with a running backpack, uh, including going to work as well. Um, yeah. how, does, how does this differ, having a race vest, a running vest? What yeah. is, what's the difference? Yeah, so I used to run in a normal backpack for a lot of years yeah. and um, it would be bouncing around, it would be hitting you on your back yeah. and everything really uncomfortable. Yeah. You'd have to stop and get things out. Whereas a race vest, it allows you to carry things all the way around. So it's much more balanced, you've got easy access to things. So it's just a lot more comfortable, especially for longer runs. Fabulous. And special, I had a, I had a quick little nose for, and also for the people that haven't, uh, just on the podcast um the quality looks great the trims Thank look you. fantastic thanks um tell me some of the special features that you've got and if you want to maybe show me yeah some of the thank special you features that'd be great yeah so all of our products are named after beautiful places in the peak district because it's cool. where we're from so cool. this is our kinder 10 litre we've got a kerber 5 litre and what these race vests allow you to do is carry your water in the front all of your snacks lots of snacks for trail running yeah. um, and then you've got side pockets for safety items and then in your back pocket you'd put things like your waterproofs your safety layers first aid kits those sorts of things so you can store it all the way around and you've also got a few different pole holders as well if you're into using poles for yeah. things like ultra running Fantastic. And a bit of high-vis there, I see. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so if yeah. you wanted to do some road runs in winter, then you've got it there as well. Different, I imagine it comes in different capacities. Talk us through the different options that are available. Yeah, that can be quite confusing sometimes. So you'll yeah. go on different sites and you'll see different numbers next to race vests. So yeah. 5, yeah. 8, 12, 15. Yeah. And it took me a long time to realise, actually, that it's the capacity of yeah. them because yeah. that's how much you can carry in the back, basically. And so we've got a five and a 10 litre. And um, so a five litre rule of thumb would be short to moderate runs. 
your 10 to 15 litres would be longer runs, also winter type runs when you're carrying more. Um, so you would pick it on how much kit you're wanting to carry. Sure. Um, but a really good tip for choosing which capacity is rather than choosing one for your race, that you might be aiming towards because there'll be a lot of checkpoints probably a lot of like aid stations yeah. it's better to choose a capacity for your longest training run because you might be going out for several hours you're not going to have anybody there to give you water um, mm -hmm. or help you with food and things yeah. so pick the capacity that you need for your training rather mm -hmm. than your events because you'll have to carry a lot more when you're out doing your long runs fantastic and i saw it's got um is it a double clip on the chest yes which exactly. is quite nice that, that seems like yeah a little so, unique yeah they've got to fit right yeah. so the sizing is everything so if you go for one that has got lots of different size options we've got six different sizes rather than say three different sizes you can get a perfect fit yeah. because if it's too small it's going to yeah. chafe and yeah. it's going to feel too tight you can't fit as much in and if it's too big you're going to get sores on your collarbones and things because it's going to move around um, and then with the back as well if you've got things like these bungee cords when you've got less kit in you can pull it nice and tight and get it a really snug fit so it feels all comfy very good i like the little details as well with the little uh, silicon talk us through that oh fab yes yeah. so to make sure that we didn't have slippy straps nothing more irritating than slippy very good. straps uh, yeah yeah um just pull it tight and then yeah. we've got these little silicone notches as well so nice. little details nice attention to detail i love and it if love you're it. out trail yeah, running yeah. you know these things so yeah yeah very good very good well thanks so much for joining us and telling us all about the about the packs and have a good rest of the year. Thank you so much. Have we'll enjoy show. the show, yes. If you have a vested interest in vest, then that running vest section was the best part for you. I could quite literally only apologise. Let's ignore that and head into some tech with Josh Patterson. Hey, it's Elise, and we're here for a bit of a tech chat today with Josh Patterson, who is the owner of the Runner app. And I feel like I probably live in a bit of a bubble of runners, but I feel like everybody is using the Runner app. Even my friend who doesn't like running messaged me to tell me she was using it the other day. But for people who don't live in the same kind of bubble, yeah. what is it? Great question. So we are basically a, a coaching app, an automated service, and it was founded originally by uh, Ben and Dom, two of the most amazing guys. And essentially... This, this tripod of men came together where myself in terms of like, I guess the marketing and the challenge sort of space uh, and the creative, Ben very much from his uh, running coaching background and Dom from his tech background kind of came together and just have created, well, at the time they'd founded, it was the Run Buddy, which was a PDF mm -hmm. service and has now kind of transitioned into this, this incredible app. And we basically create tailor plans from 5K all the way up to 250 yeah. kilometer ultras. And it is for runners of all abilities. If you have never run before, it's the app for you. If you are an elite level runner, it's the app for you. <laughs> now we have got some of the most exciting and best running coaches around the country uh, that are providing this service. And um, it's just been, it's been so special. I just think there are so many pillars to this company and so many experiences that we've managed to achieve through it. You know, it's not just the app itself, but the events that we throw. For us, the community yeah. is everything. We want to try and connect people from different walks of life. We want to inspire as many people as we possibly can. And, um, you know, recently we just celebrated selling a plan. I think it was to our 184th country worldwide. Now, for a conversation, you know, three years ago, to being at this point now, I think it's just testament to the incredible team that we have in, in you know, within Runner. And, um, you know, may it continue, like where this could go to, I just think is what makes it so exciting. And, and ultimately to anyone that's downloaded the app, thank you because it's because of you. Yeah, so it's amazing to have people all over the world. Yeah. So kind of how does it work in terms of like, what can someone expect? They download the yeah. app, like what do they, what do they get? Great question. So for us, I think what was really important was flexibility. Yeah. So when, uh, you know, back in the day, you probably would get a plan. It, it would be quite regimented in the sense that this is the day you do it. And there was sort of like no, no leniency on it. The reality is with life right now, whether that be career, relationship, friendship, you have to have movement. And so when you go to actually sign up, you can choose how many days a week you wish to train. That could be anywhere from if you wanted to do one to five. Yeah. Um, what day you want to do your long run on. Then you would put your time in because we want to get that right. We don't want you going too hard or too little. 
But what's great about it is, is say weekly your schedule changes, you can shift it. Because we don't want anyone ever to feel like they're missing a session. So for us, it is about that movement. And I think a really key feature that we've integrated uh, is strength and conditioning. Yeah. So many people, when it comes to that side of things, including myself, had no idea what to do. And so having that, the synergy between that and the running is so valuable. And I think anyone that's been in this running space now for a while will tell you how important the gym actually is. Oh my God, as a chronically injured person who is really lazy at strength and condition, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And the, but I don't been able to like move your long run around. Sounds great. Because yeah. I don't know who came up with the Sunday long run, but the Saturday long run is so much better. Yeah. You get it out of the way, you can yeah. enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah. Whereas every plan is like, isn't it? Like long run Sunday. And you're like, but what if I go to netball on a Tuesday? Yeah. And so yeah, the flexibility sounds amazing. For the headspace, you know, and, and, and what we're really proud of, even things like, you know, with smartwatches, all our plans are integratable on, okay. on the majority of smartwatches now. So you are literally guided through your workout. You can also have audio on your phone. We've just integrated um, a new system, which is so exciting with certain treadmills with Bluetooth activity, where you can now integrate your plan on that treadmill. So it will literally do it for you. Oh, so instead of you having to do the old conventional yeah. way of pushing that button, just the session itself just makes it so much easier. Yeah. Ultimately, where we're at right now and what we're continuing to strive for is to make running as accessible as testing, but as enjoyable as it possibly can be. So unlike the accessibility front, kind of what's the what's the price point of this? Like how much does it cost to get so, involved? Yeah, you've got two options. You can either do monthly yeah. or our yearly subscription is hundred pounds. Okay. And that is unlimited access to everything. So if you change from your marathon plan to a 5K plan, you just make that transition yeah. over. Now, for us, you know, when it comes to one-on-one to, to -on -one coaching, there's obviously that intimacy mm. there. But the big thing is about affordability. If we want people to be able to get into this sport, price is going to be a yeah. key figure. Um, and at any point you wish to cancel it, like any other platform, you're more than welcome to do that. But we would love to think that we could retain yeah. your custom <laughs> and support you through your journey as long as possible. Yeah, it sounds like a really good kind of mid, heart, like midway point between, because obviously having a coach is great, but yeah. you like to say, it's expensive. I had one and I was like, yeah. I'm spending a lot of money on someone telling me to go for a run. I yeah. should just go for a run. Yeah, I mean, I, and we don't, it's not a case of... Um, this market is 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 very broad, and it's it's not a case of we're trying to take that that business away. Yeah. For us, we have coaches yeah. ourselves. It's it's great sometimes when you are of a certain standard to be kept accountable mm. by someone. But the reality is, for someone, the difference between a hundred pounds a year and potentially spending anywhere from eighty to one hundred and fifty yeah. to two hundred a month. Yeah. It just comes down to what you can. And I mean, if it gets to a point where someone becomes even more invested and they make the transition from the app to a one-on-one -on -one coach, great. Ultimately for us as a platform, if you are running, that makes us happy. Perfect. So if anyone likes the sound of this, like where can they find you? So yeah, I mean, if you've got our Instagram page, um, you can find us on there. Equally, uh, myself or Ben Parker's pages or Anya Culling or Steph Davies, Beth Potter. We've got some phenomenal names. Some big in, names. In, <laughs> some good names. But that's what's great. I think it's just when, when you're investing in a product, you want to ensure that the people that are orchestrating it behind the scenes are of a certain calibre. Yeah. And for us, what these individuals are doing in the space is what makes them so exciting. When you look at the likes of someone like an Anya Culling, I remember meeting her years ago in Norfolk, and, and I think Anya's uh, first marathon was over five hours. Yeah. She's now running for England, running like a 2.34-ish time, it's I think, for her marathon. Miraculous. <laughs> and, and, and what's amazing about that is that there are so many men, women, and children now that can look at Anya and see where she was and where she is yeah. now, and it just makes anything possible. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, so, yeah, check out Runner if you're interested. Hell yeah, I'm interested, Elise. I'm also interested in this upcoming section with Vassos Alexander. Part two, coming your way. I have this um, I have this thing where in my first ever marathon, which was Barcelona with my yep. cousin, just when it started to sting, I passed the open doorway of our hotel yeah. at about 19 miles. And I was I, at that point, I realised I was running through treacle. I hadn't quite done mm -hmm. the training because I'd been injured. Niggles, I would now call them, but yeah. back then they were injuries. <laughs> um, and I thought, oh, well, I, I could just stop now. You know, I could go and have a bath and a beer. I've run further than I've ever run before. Yeah. There'll be other chances to do marathons. And then I sort of, this little penny dropped, and I realised that I would care mm -hmm. if I stopped. No one else would, but I would. So I just carried on. And it was, you know, how do you eat an elephant? 
one mouthful yeah. at a time. And that's the only thing, you know, if people say, what have you, you know, what have you got in your armory? Yeah. I'm not fast, <laughs> I'm not that fit, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that good. I just won't give up. Yeah. You know, I have one do not finish on my record and that was a five day mountain race when literally, I, I went into it with a, with a sprained ankle. And when they pulled me off the mountain after three and a half days, it looked like my leg was on oh, upside down. It's such a strange hobby, isn't it? The things yeah. we do to ourselves. Um, but every other way, you know, even the, the arc of attrition, yeah. I, I basically got a, a stress fracture after 60 miles. But, I, you know, I have this I will continue mentality. Yeah. And if you take give up off the menu, yeah, all that's left is carry on. So just get to the next street corner, get to the next tree, get to the next kilometre marker in whatever yeah. you know, race you're doing and just just carry on and eventually the finish line comes. Yeah, I think it definitely is that. I was doing a race in the Azores last year and I was ready to quit at one aid station. They kept being like, come on, you can just go to the next aid station, the next aid station. Mm. And it is that, like you say, like just breaking it down into chunks. But I always feel like this kind of ultra sort of amateur running that, well, that I do, is, just feels like worlds apart from the running and kind of people breaking 100 metre world records and stuff. I know you've obviously commentated at the Olympics. Mm. How, like, yeah, I guess, like, what's the experience of being at, like, that level of sport, like, compared to when you're slogging it out on the coast path? Well, it's, um, it's two different sports, yeah. isn't it? Um, I, um, I remember I was doing a film um, with a British long jumper. Yeah. And just before the 2012 Olympics, and we were doing a little warm up around an indoor yeah. track. We were being filmed, and he was like, "You can keep up with me." <laughs> okay. Sorry, but what? <laughs> you know, you can run. He goes, "Yeah, but that's like, I'm fast twitch. I can my long jumper. I can okay. I can jump eight meters, yeah. but I can't keep up with you over 800." Yeah. Um, and and I said, "Okay, there are two completely different, you know, forms of muscle." I suddenly saw that yeah. sort of that that penny dropped. And yeah, it's a it's a completely different thing watching Usain Bolt, which is one of the great yeah. sights. You know, watching him win in Beijing, which was his first Olympic gold medal, when nobody knew he was going to win. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's one of the highlights of my career. But it's nothing like standing on the start line of an ultra yeah. or a marathon or even a park run. It's the same mm. sort of sport, but it's just different gravy. Having said that, in a major marathon, you are sharing the streets yeah. and you're sharing the race with the greats of the sport. That first ever Great North Run that I did, 2010, I think, in, um, well, Newcastle to South Shields, I think Heidi Gebris, so Lassie was in the field. Yeah. I mean, come <laughs> on, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that is, like, the amazing thing about those big city events, isn't it? Because most of us are never going to go to the Olympics, never going to share a start yeah. line with Usain Bolt, but you can. You just pay 30, 40, 50 quid, enter a race, yeah. and, yeah, like you say, share the streets with these absolute great, of the sport. Yeah, I mean, on the, in the London Marathon, if you, um, if you time it right, yeah, and, and you have to be quite speedy, but if you do time it right, you're turning right off Tower Bridge and there's like four or five miles where um, the elites are coming past that way, yeah. five miles or ten miles ahead of you, eight miles ahead yeah. of you, but you can see yeah. them. You know, you're literally there on the same course as you. I saw Mo Farah one yeah. year and I saw, saw Elliot Kipchoge yeah. and I saw the elite women. I, you know, it's just... It's so inspirational. Yeah. We're in the same race. Yeah. And I think you get that even just like watching a race, don't you? After years of watching my mum, my dad and my brother run London Marathon, I'd say me and my mum are pro marathon watchers. And it's amazing, yeah, you can, in the course of a day, watch the elites come past, watch your dad, and then the people at the back of the pack, which I think are the heroes of mm. any race, of in one they are. race. Absolutely, yeah. I've started, I've taken to running the London Marathon in a massive minion costume. Nice. Um, <laughs> and Honestly, that takes that takes the, yeah. the whole joy of it to a new level because all the people, especially the kids, yeah. and I'm on the faster end of the massive costumes, yeah. so I'm, I'm often the first massive costume anyone sees. Yeah. And so they've been clapping the big runners, you know, the proper runners. So yeah. then suddenly you hear minion, minion. <laughs> so you have to, it is your solemn duty if yeah. you run in a massive minion costume. I mean, we're talking you can't see no. anything. You know, there's a little eye hole there, yeah. so you've got that tiny field of vision there. You can't get a drink in because your arms are out here and there's a, there's a costume. You're s the hotter than the hell. Yeah. But it is your solemn duty to high five every single child between Greenwich and the yeah. Mall. Your solemn yeah. duty, and if you don't, you're you know, you are you are very much out of the Minion gang. Yeah. Um, 
But that is just great yeah. because, you know, you are you're not taking yourself too seriously. You're still running the race. Yeah. You know, you still finish with a medal. But, yeah, you, you bring a little bit of joy along the way to, to, to the people watching. Yeah, for sure. I, mean, I remember we were watching one year. My brother was having quite a tough race and my sister-in-law just shouted at him, come on, Chris, a root vegetable's beating you. Yeah. And it's just all those yeah people mixed in together. Have mm. you got anything exciting coming up this year or any big running plans? Or um, Running plans this year are slightly... Well, I'm chair of my local running club, okay. Barnes Runners, which I have been for a, a few months now, which takes up a lot of time, yeah. but it's, it's very rewarding. It's great. Yeah. And those kind of roles, I think, like getting involved in like local kind of grassroots mm. sort of sport and mm. volunteering and those coaches, they're the reason this can exist. Exactly. Really. They're, Absolutely um, they are. Like yeah. people, and people who are part di- directing park run and doing those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. So important. Yeah. Thank God yeah. for all volunteers for all races. Yeah. Or genuinely, for all park runs everywhere. Um, for all running clubs, for all running coaches, for everybody yeah. who just gives back. Park Run are very careful not to say thank you f- to the volunteers for giving up your time. Yeah. Because you're not giving up your time. Right. Because actually you get almost as much, if not more yeah. out of it than the runners do, but just volunteering. It's such a community thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of that. I'm coaching kids in the summer on a, on a Sunday morning yeah. as well. Um, but my big thing this year is a swimming thing. I'm, I'm doing a, so I've got a channel tied, so I'm doing a, a solo attempt at the channel in September. Yeah. So I'm trying to learn to swim. Okay. Um, in time for that, um, whilst doing a few races here and there. There's talk of a 215 mile across Scotland. Yeah. Sean Conway's, <laughs> Sean Conway's trying to get me involved. It might be a bit too close to the channel, but I might not be able to resist it. Are you finding that trying to learn to swim, is that a similar experience to when you took up running kind of a little bit, well, sort of um, in the middle of your life? Or Yeah, I could always swim and I could always yeah. enjoy swimming. And I was always like, right. Yeah. Um, and then I went to see a bloke called Ray in Canary <laughs> Wharf. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, you're all right. Okay. But you're doing this wrong, this wrong and this yeah. wrong. So why don't you... So honestly, I'm. I do like if I do a weight session, I'll always end with half an hour in the pool doing raised drills. I kept what? Oh, uh, raised drills. <laughs> raised drills, and I'm just going up and down the pool really slowly, just doing my little, my yeah. little swim drills, so I can get yeah. It'll be nice because even if I don't manage to swim across the channel, I'll be a better swimmer for it. Yeah. And swimming is. It's not as good as running, <laughs> but. And I'll deny that in a swimming event, but it's yeah. just not. We all know. Well, it's right. because you can't see it. Like I, I've got a lot. Of, I live in the Lake District now, yeah. so I've got a lot of friends who do a lot of long distance swimming in the lakes. Yeah. But it's like your head's under the lake. You can't. You know, even in a sub three yeah. marathon, a few times I remember talking to people. You know, come on, mate, yeah. you're doing well. Do you want to water? A little bit of encouragement. You can't see yeah. anyone or anything. Anyone who breathes looks like they're angry. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're you're just looking down. It's quite nice when you're doing it for a couple of hours just on your own. But it's, if there's one thing nearly as good as running, it's swimming because it's just, it feels so natural. It feels yeah. like you're doing right by your DNA. Okay. You know, <laughs> so I do, I do, I do love it, but it's just not quite, it's not quite running. Yeah. Well, you've got to have one favourite, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks so much, Vassos. Just to finish, if you had one tip for someone who's maybe not done much running, but they really, they've heard your passion for it and want to start, what would be your one tip for a beginner? Um, I would say, please don't overthink it and just get out and start doing it. And you don't have to think, like, yeah, I've got to be able to run for half an hour straight before I'm a runner. If you can walk and then run, shuffle for 30 seconds, <laughs> walk four minutes, shuffle 30 seconds. Walk five minutes, shuffle 30 seconds. That's a run, right? And yeah. then you would just... And I, as I found when I started, you just the... The bits of running increase, the bits of walking decrease, and before you know it, you'll be running 10 minutes yeah. and thinking, do I even need my minute of <laughs> yeah. walking here? And then you think, how many have to run 20 minutes? That was when I thought, I'm a runner. Yeah. But actually, I was late to the party. The first time you get on a pair of shoes, doesn't it have to be perfect. Don't overthink it. Just get out and start and let running do the rest. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Vassos. Thank you. <laughs> Loads of great stuff in that interview, and from running radio presenters to goats in a field. Yeah, yeah, I, I promise it makes sense. Hello, it's Jamie from Rundwear, and this is now the race and event section of the episode. And we're joined with uh, Steve Cram and his new event, the Wild Goat Festival. We're calling Festival. it. Festival. Yeah. Good. Um, so yeah, we've we organise uh, fairly traditional kind of events 
road races, city centres, and and um, yeah. uh, it kind of was born out of our our Kiel the Marathon weekend, which is at a beautiful spot, and then we've introduced yeah. our ultra event there, the um, the Northumbrian, and people were chatting to us there about you know look that that idea of trail running is now becoming much yeah. bigger, yeah. and obviously Northumbrian's a it's a triathlon, um, so the biking and. Uh, I guess in our team as well, you know, my yeah. daughter, my son, myself, we've always done a bit. So we uh, were involved with uh, Carfest um, uh, Runfest yes. a while back. Is that Chris Evans's? Yeah, yeah. And we, we sort of helped yeah. deliver the Runfest bit when it, it fell into post-COVID. Yeah. And then it we, we, we were going to, or they were going to resurrect it, decided not to. And we thought, you know what, there's something in this. Anyway, so Wild Goat Festival is, um, it's going to be fairly small the first t- time. Um, yeah. But it's for those who want to come and have a weekend, yeah. camp van, camping, whatever. You can come for the day as well. Yeah. But we want to just combine that whole idea of, of if you're uh, either riding or running yeah. out in what is stunning countryside up in the Lake District. Hoka Hall is a stunning place. Amazing. And the South Lakes, um, great big estate. Cartmel, where they make sticky toffee pudding okay. or the home of sticky toffee yeah. pudding. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of up on the fells on that side, the grounds of, of and it, it, it almost touches the right at the top of what you would think of as Morecambe Bay, because that stretches all the way up north okay. to the Lake District. So it's yeah. pretty stunning. Um, food, wine, music, run, bike. Various runs and bikes yep. throughout the day. Yeah, so you can, if you come for the weekend, you can do yeah. anything. You can do any of the runs, and they go from 5K up, up to half marathon running wise and Fabulous. then we've got some kind of introductory stuff yeah. on the bikes well for those who've maybe not done gravel riding before Brilliant. so you can do everything yeah. from learning how to do that oh, to going on a pretty long gravel uh, ride as well Wonderful. which i think is about 40 odd k and what's the date again sorry uh so it's the last weekend in may which is the okay. bank holiday weekend very good um, yeah so the weather yeah. will be stunning yeah um yeah so we're really looking forward to it so yeah that that's uh, it's a bit of a departure for us, but something we're really looking forward to. Fabulous. And in terms of like food and beverage, is there other, other yeah, places? Yeah, so I, we've, we've, I mean, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm one of the, my team say I'm the worst organiser of events because I'm always very conscious about cost. Yeah. So um, what we've done is if you want to, there's a package which includes all of your food. Because yeah. the thing about going to festivals, it's often, yeah. yeah, that's the fee to go to the festival. Right. And then you pay a lot of money for you know your food yeah, yeah. across the weekend so we've rolled it all in so okay. there's catering provided so if you're camping ah. or if you've come in your camper van yeah you don't need to worry about you you know cooking and the rest of it yeah um so breakfast and evening meal taken care of brilliant um and there's other uh, uh, i mean hooker hall itself has a beautiful yeah. very nice cafe and things like that as well if you want to do that yeah. but there's other food on site yeah. so but we for i think for the majority of people they'll take the catering option because yeah I think it's very affordable yeah. and it just takes that stress out of... Certainly out of when weekend. you're travelling with families and, yeah, and, and the kids. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we, we're trying to... One of the things we're also keen on doing, we're working with the sort of local mountain rescue and a lot of other uh, local uh, practitioners and agencies and, to be fair, the, the kind of um, those who work in that part of the world in in retail everything from food and beverage yeah the tourism thing because what we're very keen is to say look you know as runners we enjoy the countryside immensely, and as riders as well so we do have a responsibility though Mm -hmm. so there's a for instance there's an organization called fix the fells okay um who are going to be part of the weekend Mm -hmm. mountain rescue as well where they'll be telling you what we can do as well to help make their job a little bit easier um so there is a bit of you know yeah. An educational element, okay. but in a good way. Fantastic. But we also want to showcase a lot of local produce yeah. um, and give them the chance to kind of you know, show people what they have and what Brilliant. they do. Yeah. So it's not just, we want people to run and ride. Yeah, and it's a, a showcase of the local area. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And so this is year one, beta yeah. testing kind of thing. But Yeah, you know, the way we tend to work is uh, we try not to go too big with things. We yeah. like to do it and find out what works, what doesn't okay. work, what people like, what they don't like, yeah. and then build on that. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we, we think this <coughs> uh, type of event is the sort mm. of thing which there's a, certainly a market for. Yeah. And if we can keep it affordable and also um, something which we, we know that site, we can grow it. 
Yeah. It's got, you know, they've got, okay. it. it's a beautiful, stately home, but it's the mm. grounds yeah. and there's deer roaming around and the, you know, it, it is stunning. Yeah. Um, so um, that's something which we know, you know, we can, we can, we can grow the event in terms of the venue yeah. um, in a way which, you know, if it's successful, we can, we can make it a much bigger event than we're going to have in year one. Fantastic. And any sort of maybe ambitions for other locations in different parts of the yeah, I mean, we, we have looked at a couple of other sites uh, down south, yeah. so uh, I think we want to get this yeah. kind of up and yeah. running. Because the other thing as well is people keep asking, what is it? What is it? Yeah. And I'm trying to explain. Yeah. So I think until we have one, mm -hmm. it's hard to actually show people yes. you know, what it is. If you say, I'm doing a 10K in a city centre, okay, I get it. Correct. But when you say something like this, yeah. it's a, a bit like the Northumbrian I mentioned, uh, uh, mm. the um, Ultra event. We're into the third year now, yeah. and now all of a sudden, you know, the yeah, entries yeah, yeah. are really going up because people we've got loads of visuals and yeah. people have been been to it, taking part. It's yeah. great. It's this. It's that. Yeah. So once you've got something to show people, yeah. and they've been, uh, hopefully, people come back, but they tell other people and all the rest yeah. of it. So I think well, let's do that first, and then we'll look to see whether we want to do it elsewhere. Fantastic, brilliant. And so, where can people go? To get the information on their website, <clears throat> just go uh, wildgoatfestival uh, dot com. Um, we've gone orange, you know, like like oh, man, it's not my world. But Josie, my daughter, and others who are kind of always going, oh, we're choosing colours and yeah. font, and and someone said, yeah, why why wild goat? <laughs> well, we, again, we wanted to kind of have a a, a little mascoty type thing. Yeah. There will be goats, yeah. but of course, some of the people we want to bring, we want to help inspire people as well. Yes. So Paula Radcliffe's going to come and Fantastic. people like that. So mm. goats in sport is, of course, greatest of all time. Perfect. Outfits so the brilliant. idea is that yeah. we give you, or you have a, yeah. you know, your greatest weekend or yeah. whatever. Or, so it's, it, it is about the goat, and there will be some goats. Um, but it's the GOAT. Yeah, that fantastic. And I guess that's inspiring for the for the family as well because you've got the children there that are inspired. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, you know, we, we, we know that um, from what we do with our training camp weekends, yeah. people love sitting and listening to yeah. people who are top in their field Absolutely. talking, whether it's about Absolutely. training, yeah. actually even if it's about things like nutrition or, mm. or um, um, you know, psychology or whatever. Yeah. So we, we, you know, we will be bringing those sort of people in that provide it i say it's entertainment i mean i think it's entertaining yeah but you can have if you just want to have a few drinks and and have a bit of a boogie you can do that as well fantastic brilliant thanks very much steve for telling right. us all about it and uh, yeah that's the brings us to the end of this week's race and event part of the episode we have our very own goat on this series i mean less greatest of all time and more features of a goat isn't that right mike anyway less animals and more nutrition with revive active hey it's elise here and i'm with aaron from revive active today who are a nutrition brand and we're going to have a chat about nutrition and running so it'd be great if you could just um give us a quick overview of the kind of products that revive active make in case people aren't familiar with you. yeah so we're revive active we're ireland's number one supplement brand um, we produce a range of different products um, and each of them are award winning. We're super proud of all of them. Um, each of them contain kind of a powerhouse of different active ingredients that all work in synergy um, for optimum benefit, whether that's kind of boosting your energy levels, strengthening your immune system, supporting kind of mental clarity and focus, your joints, and then also, um, also supporting your skin, hair and nails from within. Um, our three products here, they are suitable for whether you're an elite athlete or you're someone that's just starting off on your running journey. Um, you kind of couple two of our products together. So this Revive Active is our flagship product. Um, it was launched in 2011 and it contains 26 different active ingredients to support your energy, your immune system, your heart health, fight fatigue, and also great for cardiovascular health. Then similarly, we have Zest Active that also supports your energy and immune system, but also is kind of targeted towards your mental performance and muscle function. So you choose either one of those, couple it with Joint Complex then, and you have the ultimate duo for any runner's routine. Um, joint Complex contains 10 active ingredients to support your joints, your cartilage, bones, connective tissue. It, each Our products are taken by Ailish McColgan, who is a world record holder and Commonwealth champion. Each morning she takes her Zesta Active and then she takes Joint Complex 
later um, in the afternoon. Amazing ambassador to yeah, have, like, clearly is. shows that, yeah, the projects must work. Just in case anyone isn't aware, doesn't have a scientific background, and I'm talking about myself there, what do you mean by an active ingredient? So active ingredient basically means because each of our products are in a port powdered formula, once you is absorb that into your body, it gets to work immediately. So it negates the need. You, you might buy a lot of vit or capsules and tablets that contains a lot of binders and fillers. It takes a lot of time for those binders and fillers to break down into your system. So having the powdered sachet means that the ingredients are active and that they can be absorbed straight away and get to work immediately. Oh, amazing. And if somebody hasn't a kind of perhaps a beginner runner and they've not used much specific sports nutrition before, how would you kind of advise they go about incorporating something like this into their running routine? Yeah, well, we'd always kind of as a brand would always recommend a food first approach. So see how your diet looks, make sure you're getting all your essential nutrients from your food. And then we always say that this is kind of a supplement on the side because we all live busy um, lives. We're all busy, whether you have kids, you have a balancing work life, a, a balance. Um, so it's hard to get all your nutrients in your food. So this is basically a, a little side that helps you kind of supplement all your kind of in ingredients, whether it's vitamins, minerals, and amino acids that you need to supplement into your diet. Obviously, sometimes the world of supplements and sports nutrition can be a bit of a minefield. How can they benefit somebody's running? Yeah, it's com it can be completely confusing. There's so many brands and supplements on the market. So basically, for, we'd always recommend ourselves as a brand as well, to always look at your diet first, look at your kind of food first approach first, see how you can improve and get all your essential nutrients in through your diet. And then supplements are there as kind of an add on. So we all live busy lives, um, whether we're juggling work, kids, family, etc. And it's hard to get all your essential nutrients in through your diet. So supplements are there to help kind of top up on kind of any vitamins, minerals that you might miss out on your diet in your diet. So a case of kind of a nice extra to help really get take people to that next level with their running. Exactly. But, but after you've got a kind of solid foundation. Yeah, so possible. food first and then look to supplement after, we'd always say. Thanks so much for coming on, Aaron. I actually learned loads and made to hear about all the science. Um, so thanks so much. Brilliant. Thanks for having me. From literal supplements to supplementing, you're running with some coaching. Some advice now with Jules. Hey, it's Elise and Mike here, and we're here for some expert advice with um, Jules from Running Rewire. So Jules is a running coach. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your coaching business and how you got into it? Yes, yeah, sure. So I, first of all, trained as a PT. Um, I was a keen runner myself and straight away knew that I wanted to help runners rather than go straight into the strength side of stuff. Um, so as soon as I had qualified, I went down the run coaching route. and didn't really touch the PT side of it at all. Uh, even though I do help runners with their strength training and that side of their coaching. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I trained with UK Athletics, uh, became a leader in running fitness first and then coach in running fitness and then started my own coaching business. And do you work with any kind of specific types of clients? Like how, and how do you coach them? Is it group coaching, individual? I uh, started off doing um, group coaching in my local area, um, then got a few more one-to-one -one clients, but mostly nowadays I work with athletes online. Okay. Um, I do still have a few one-to-ones, but it's mostly, mostly online, most, mostly marathon runners, uh, mostly female, um, and mostly women sort of of menopausal age. And do you find like, because I think often when people have got a race lined up or something, you just get a cookie cutter plan off the internet. Do you find, is there anything specific that you have to do differently for female clients? Like any different focuses? You, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, this is getting into the nitty gritty <laughs> sort of thing. Um, some women will not be affected by the menstrual cycle. Other other women will. Yeah. Um, so I do sort of have a chat to them about that. If we can factor in recovery weeks when their cycle, you know, in, in their cycle, they they have less less energy, then we'll do that. Um, also, women of menopausal age, they've got. A whole load of different things to, to factor in. Obviously, their drop in estrogen is having an effect on their body. They might be feeling more fatigue. Um, they might have had a little bit of weight gain. Um, I know a lot of women that suffer with anxiety. So even just getting out the door is a massive thing for them. So working with a run coach, they're, they're sort of they, they feel a bit more supported um, and and able to 
able to follow a plan and just have that someone in their corner. Is that one of the best things about having a run coach? Is that it makes you kind of accountable? Is that one absolutely? Of yeah. So you know, you, yeah, you, you're right. You can sort of follow a plan off the internet. Um, I think the problem that lots of people run into with that is if something goes wrong, if they're not able to keep up with that certain session on a certain day, you know, they might be ill, they might pick up an injury, mm. life happens, you know, they might be, go on holiday. Um, and then it's very difficult, I think, for them to then know where to pick up if they've had to take some time off of that plan. So working with a run coach is all very adaptable. You know, it's very, very much tailored to the individual. And if they have to take a break for some reason, then obviously we factor that in and, and you know, they, they don't get confused. Of, you know, where, where on earth am I on this plan? Where do I start again? So yeah. some, someone like me who's never used a running coach, um, what, why should I use a running coach? What's it going to help me do better? Well, lots of people come to me because, well, there's various different reasons. So they might have been training a while and hit a plateau, for example. They're just not seeing the results that they want to anymore. Um, they may have had recurring injuries and they want to get to the bottom of that and, and you know, train in a more safe and effective way. Um, another reason might be that they... But, well, they might not have even done an event before, so they, they just want to have that guidance um, as they're beginning their journey. And some people, I think, just just do need that structure and accountability and motivation because it is hard to put your trainers on and motivate yourself to get out the door sometimes. Um, I mean, well, look at the weather right now. It's certainly the case. <laughs> um, so having just having um, the support, having the motivation, having someone to check in with... Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a massive, massive help. Yeah, I definitely found I, I had a stint of having a running coach. Just the fact I was paying them every month. I was like, I've literally paid somebody. You've got to, you've got to show up. On this <laughs> run. I've got to go. <laughs> is there anything, if people were looking for a running coach, other than looking to running rewire, of course, is there anything specific in terms of qualifications or whatever that people can look out for? Because I think they anyone can kind of call themselves a coach can't yeah. they like what should what are some specific kind of key traits somebody should be looking for well i mean yeah you can you can coach somebody running without having gone down the same yeah. route as i did but um i think it's the same with anything if you're wanting a coach no matter what area you're looking at in life you know it could be life coaching finance you know um yeah, any sort, any sort of coaching. I think the main thing is, the reason you want to coach is because you are here and you want to get there. Like, you want to see progress in some area of your life. So you need to find someone and have a chat to them and have a conversation with them um, and ask them, have they achieved what you want to achieve or have they helped other people achieve what you want to achieve because there's no point in, in any area any coaching going to someone who is not on the same page as you yeah definitely do you find like have you got quite a personal relationship with your clients do you really I yeah. guess you get it's quite because I think running can be quite like a personal thing I have weekly check-ins with them um they update me how they're getting on I give them feedback of the week that they've just done then I adapt their training on a weekly basis so I don't just write a plan and hand it over um, and I think, yeah, it's, it, I think they really like the sort of personal side so, of that. So what are the most common mistakes you would say that runners make? Um, lack of consistency. That's me. Uh. <laughs> yeah, hands up as well. <laughs> I think that's a big thing. I think if you want to see results, you have to show up. You have to be consistent. Um, and, yeah, like I said, that's hard. But when you've got a coach and someone to be accountable to, that makes it a whole lot easier. Um, and the people I work with as well, we have quite a nice community. So it's a bit of camaraderie as well. You know, we've got Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups, everyone's sort of motivating each other. Um, that can really help. But what yeah, about the variety of training? is like Because someone like me, I tend to run at the same pace, often the same routes, quite regularly. Is that quite common? I've seen your Strava, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> <Same run. laughs> it's really common, but it really depends what your goals are. If you're wanting to get faster, if you're wanting to go for a certain time in a race, then, yeah, you do have to mix up the training. You can't just do everything the same speed and accept, uh, you know, expect to progress and get faster. So it really does depend what their goals are. So if, if a beginner came to yeah. me, Obviously, we wouldn't be worrying about pace, anything like that, not really mixing up the sessions too much initially, um, but just building that consistency. 
Um, once you've got that, then absolutely, you know, mixing up paces, tempo runs, intervals, hill, you know, it, it depends what experience the runner has, basically. And what does, like, the coaching process look like? If you've got, if you had somebody who did never had any coaching before who might be a bit nervous to get involved with a coach, like, what, what would that process look like from somebody contacting you? Um, so I, first of all, have a phone conversation with them. Yeah. Which I think is really important, rather than them just filling in a form and doing it all all online I actually speak to them um, then if we have a discussion and, and, and we find out that yeah you know I can help them and they want to work with me then I will get them to fill out um, medical form yeah. detailed questionnaire about exactly what their goals are I also help them with goal setting and race planning if that's their if that's what they want to do um, and then and then yeah just ease them ease them into it <laughs> and, and are, you, are you like do you follow your own sort of instruction are you a really disciplined runner and I have a coach do you yeah Co coaches have coaches <laughs> so hang on you have a coach how intimidating is that for your coach <laughs> yeah. um uh, it works well he has a coach <laughs> yeah. It's like, so you all just employ each other. That's how the industry keeps going. That's really interesting. So it's actually something that you think, like, through the benefit comes kind of from the coaching process rather than just the knowledge of the coach. Because obviously you've got a lot of amazing knowledge, but still just that, have that dynamic yeah, of having a coach. It, it, it's a mixture, it's a mixture of yeah. both. Um, I think plenty of PTs will have their own PT. I think as well, it's very, it's very easy for me to tell other people what to do. But I just like being told what to do. Yeah. I don't want to have to think <laughs> about my own <laughs> my own training. So, so yeah, I, I wouldn't do without my coach. And are you training for any big races right now? I am, yeah. I've got Tokyo in six weeks, Tokyo Marathon. And are you going for a tie? <laughs> I am, <laughs> yeah. Are you going to tell us what it is? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to get a good for age for New York Marathon, let's put it that way. Okay. What's, are we allowed to ask what good for age is? <laughs> uh, at the moment, I'm at the top of my age bracket, so this is the good thing about turning 50 mm. next year, is I go into the bottom of my age bracket and everything becomes a bit easier. Um, but at the moment, it's uh, sub-338. Wow. Gosh. For, for New York. It's a toughie to get into, good for age. So we are going to have you back on post the race. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're going to see if you hit your time. And if you didn't, no one do coaching. <laughs> but if she did, then you have to all use her. This will either be the best or the worst <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I wish she hadn't told me to put it out there now. But <laughs> again, that's nice for accountability, right? Yeah. I've, I've said it. It's out there in the world. In so the technically, world. we're your coach. So could you give me some money? <laughs> we'll send you your programme, Jules. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming on, Jules. It's great to chat and good luck with your marathon. Thank you very much. To be honest, I think running that time in a marathon would be good for any age, not just age group. Well done, Jules, and best of luck. Back to our host to tie up. OK, guys, that was awesome. Thanks very much for listening. Um, I want to stay on the theme of advice while we're closing off the show today. Um, I was just thinking about the worst piece of advice you've ever been given or the biggest mistake you've ever made with running. I'll tell you mine first <laughs> to start it off. So my first ever marathon... I ran in a pair of high techs that I bought mm. from a shop called Bacon's, which is a discount shoe shop that they used to have <laughs> in Belper in Derbyshire, which is where I'm from. And I had no idea that, like, you needed special shoes to run in. And I know that sounds really silly because, mm. you know, we're in the running industry yeah. now and actually a lot of people listening to this must think, what an idiot. But actually, there must be so many mistakes like that that happens. And you got yeah. anything like that? Yeah, I, I actually, mine's on footwear as well. Yeah. yeah, just being recommended, and I'm not going to mention names or whatever, but recommended certain footwear that you, you buy into the narrative, you try it, and actually it either can get you injured by using... An, going up on your volume in new footwear too fast, too quick, yeah. um, I think is a big thing that I found, especially with some of my friends who are maybe not runners, but then they come in and then maybe marathon training. So I find that that's a, a big kind of whatever trainers you're using come in slowly and build up to see if it works before you go in too hard. Trainers are really personal, yeah. right? And yeah. actually, we yeah. always say go and get specialist fitting because it, it's... <coughs> I often get asked, what's the best running shoe? And yeah. I'm like, well, th yeah. there's no answer to that <laughs> yeah. question because it's yeah. the best running shoe for you. So I totally yeah. agree. Elise, what you got? Um, definitely. So my friend Sophie, who is an amazing runner, much better than me, um, we tried, uh, tried to run our first ultra together both DNF'd for many reasons, but we didn't, ha I know we've got an amazing interview with Harrier um, on this series all about the benefits of running packs. 
We didn't have those. So Sophie ran 45 miles holding like a 750 mil cycling oh, bottle. No. <laughs> and I just think, how did she do it? It's mad. It's so difficult. And it's, these are the mistakes that you, yeah. that you make. And actually, I think it's really important that running is a bit of a journey, right? You learn as you go. So. Yeah, it's experience. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. And you're very experienced, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> not, not very. I'm, I've made all the mistakes. <laughs> yeah. um, right, guys, thank you very much for joining us on this episode of the Running Show Pod Show in association with Runderwear. If you'd like to get the enter the competition, then don't forget to look in the show notes and you can enter to win a £100 Runderwear voucher. Or if you go to the Runderwear checkout, enter the code pod show at the checkout to get 10 percent off thank you for joining us we'll be back next week with another one before you jump away from us please follow and leave a rating if you're listening to this as a podcast and if you're watching on youtube please like subscribe and leave a comment let us know what you thought we'll see you same place same time next week for the next episode of the national running pod show